architecture. So now we defined, we've defined the foundation uh, of a CBTC system, which was the building blocks, ATO, ATP, and ATS. <clears throat> so based on IEEE 1474.3, we can have three types of architecture. There's a, a type one, which is CBI based. Type two, which is no C CBTC, are basically these types of, of systems. Architecture. So now we've defined, we've defined the foundation uh, of a CBTC system, well, which was the building blocks, ATO, ATP, and ATS. <clears throat> so based on IEEE 1474.3, we can have three types of architecture. There's a, a type one, which is CBI based, type two, which is no CBI, and type three, which is a train centric uh, architecture. Uh, now, each one of these architecture uh, is going to fulfill all of the functions that are defined by the the, uh, the building blocks I talked about earlier, ATP, ATO, and ATS. Sorry, let me rephrase that. It's going to satisfy most of the uh, functions defined uh, in the in the building block sections within the architecture itself, and I'll show you how that's done. So let's start with the, the first architecture, which is a CBI-based architecture. Uh, you have your ATS, you have your wayside unit itself, and the CBI system along with the vehicle controller. This is your basic architecture of a CBI-based system. Now, in this system, the ATS is, is the uh, system that operates the entire line. It's your eyes and ears that I mentioned earlier. Uh, all functions of the ATS building block that I talked about earlier are covered by this function, by, by this subsystem uh, in, in the CBTC architecture, in this architecture. The wayside, it controls the movement of all the trains. Basically, it's, it's setting the movement authorities. It's aware of all the trains in the system and it's ensuring that the trains are separated properly between them. So it sets the movement authority. Some ATP functions that I talked about earlier are covered by the wayside. And I'll go through that in a, in a little bit, what those functions are. The CBI, or the computer-based interlocking system, it contains all the interlocking logic. It basically is, it depends on the design, but it's usually um, using conventional fixed block principles inside the CBI to control these uh, interlocking logic uh, for the system. It controls all discrete IO devices, switches, signals, etc. It provides secondary train detection. And this box also does some aspects of the ATP building block um, that we talked about. The VC or the vehicle controller. This controls the entire train. All functions from the ATO are covered by the vehicle controller, and some ATP functions are covered by the vehicle controller here. So this is your CBI-based architecture. Um, sorry, and finally you have your data communication systems, which is your radio link, your wireless link uh, between the trains, the wayside, and the uh, ATS itself. So this is your CBI-based architecture. Now, what you see in front of you here are all of the functions that I talked about in the building block section. If you recall, uh, for uh, ATP, we had safe train separation, we had end of track protection, we had work zone protection, restricted routes, uh, et cetera. So all the building blocks that I talked about are listed here, indicating which subsystem is actually controlling it. So in the case of the ATS, here are all your ATS functions that's controlled. In the case of the CBI, it's controlling the, the, these functions here, positioning, door control, routing, work zone, broken rail, grade, grade crossings. The wayside is controlling your safe train separation, end of track protection, work zone protection, your restricted route, and the vehicle is controlling the speeds, the position, et cetera, along with all of the ATO functions. This makes up your, your CBI. Now, what, what are the aspects of CBI, uh, important aspects of it? Well, there are two parts to this system. Uh, there's a CBI, uh, sorry, there's a conventional fixed block system, and then there's the moving block part of it, and the two are working together. Now, depending on the design for this architecture, the conventional fixed block can be the master and the CBTC is a slave, uh, and the second type of design, it can be the CBTC is the master and the conventional is the, sla is the slave. And this is an important distinction because it affects how the uh, system is going to operate and how the system and how the operator is going to to use a system. 
in the first case where the fixed block is the master, um, the interlocking is defined for the, the, uh, the fixed block design is defined by the CBI and established. And the wayside will, uh, will try to bring the trains closer together by uh, inter interfacing with the CBI itself um, to decide if it can bring these trains closer together. So in this case, the CBTC is, is operating um, as, a, as a slave. In the other system where CBTC is the master, the design is established for the CBTC moving block and the fixed block is put on top of it. So in this case, the fixed block is, is constantly requesting for permission from the CBTC in terms of what it can do or not. But these are the two uh, aspects of, of the design and it's an important uh, distinction between the two. The core moving block principles in this architecture reside within the wayside and the vehicle controller itself. That's where the moving block principles are. Um, and it's the interaction between the wayside and the CBI, uh, which affects how the CBTC system is going to operate itself. But the moving block principles, they reside on the wayside and the vehicle controller uh, itself. In this architecture, interoperability between two different suppliers, uh, it's a challenge because much of the interface between the wayside, the vehicle, and the wayside and the CBI is proprietary, unique to that supplier. Each supplier has its own interface, has its unique abilities, uh, and for another supplier to interface with it uh, is a challenge uh, and it becomes difficult. Although uh, I will caveat that by saying that in New York, they do have a system, uh, they have a spec, I squared S, that defines an interoperability spec between Siemens and Talus. So they've been able to do it and they are actually running a system, a line using that principle. <clears throat> but it, it is still a challenge in, in terms of using this architecture to do interoperability um, with another supplier. So architecture number two, uh, no CBI base. So what this architecture is, is saying uh, is that the CBI is removed from the architecture completely and all CBI functions, they are transferred to the wayside itself. So your architecture looks something like this. You have your ATS, you have your wayside, and you have your vehicle controller. The ATS and the vehicle controller characteristics, <clears throat> they don't change. But all CBI functions are now controlled by the wayside itself. So what you see here now is, in the previous uh, diagram, the uh, blue functions were part of the CBI. Uh, well, they're now part of the, of the wayside. So the wayside is now controlling all of these functions, which were previously the responsibility of the CBI. Um, and, and now you basically remove the box and you have a wayside system. Usually in an architecture like this, there is no secondary detection. Uh, it is a full CBTC unhindered. <clears throat> uh, and the full moving block principles are, are applied here. Um, but you can have secondary detection in this. The wayside can do it. I've seen it done. I've done it myself. <clears throat> but the design is, is, is slightly different. So in this system, um, pure moving block system with no secondary train detection, as I mentioned earlier, moving block functions are shared between the wayside and the vehicle controller. Uh, but again, the, uh, the, the interface between the, the vehicle controller uh, the vehicle controller and the wayside is again proprietary to each supplier. Um, and for another supplier to come in and interface with it, it can be a challenge. I'm not saying it can't be done. It can be, but it is a challenge when you try to take the wayside from supplier A and try to connect it to the vehicle controller of supplier B. So interoperability is a still a challenge, although it's a little bit easier from the previous architecture. Now, type three, train-centric. So in this architecture, the uh, wayside is now removed um, and the vehicle controller and the ATS are the two subsystems that are, that are controlling the system. So this type of architecture looks something like this. Uh, the EC is the new f subsystem that's been introduced here. And it's basically what I call the element controller. It's functionally not the same as the wayside, um, it controls field elements such as switches, points, or platform doors, but it does not contain any of the moving block logic like movement authority or routing. Uh, all those functions are now part of, of the vehicle controller or of part of the ATS itself. So the entire moving block logic now resides on the vehicle controller itself. Um, and, and the second thing that's introduced by this architecture is the fact that 
the two vehicles, vehicle one or vehicle controller one and vehicle controller two, now can talk to each other or they, they are able to talk to each other uh, to determine certain information in terms of the location of that train. Uh, so this is the architecture for a train-centric uh, solution. And in this case, uh, all the red functions, which were previously a part of the wayside, now all reside within the vehicle controller itself. So all the moving block logic is now sitting on the vehicle controller, hence the train-centric architecture. The ATS is simply monitoring all the trains, communicating with trains, giving them routes, but the vehicle controller is, is deciding when it's going to route it, what is the safe separation between trains, how far I'm going to go, when I'm going to request the switch to turn, um, when I'm going to open the platform doors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so all that logic resides on the vehicle controller. The element controller or the EC, all it's doing is basically telling the switch to turn when it's requested by the VC or open platform doors, etc. It is a very dumbed down box. It does not have any moving block logic on there. So in this architecture, trains are communicating with each other, VC to VC. Uh, the main limitation in this architecture is the bandwidth or the, the communication uh, uh, medium the, that's used, like the radio. Moving block principles reside within the VC itself, making it easier for supplier A to uh, interface with supplier B. Because, and the reason I say that is when the entire moving block principle sits on the vehicle controller, well, all it has to really do is, is communicate with the EC and tell it, move the switch, uh, reverse or normal, or tell the EC, open doors or close. But the moving authority or the routing is all on the vehicle controller itself. So if a supplier has a vehicle controller with that logic, another supplier, which can come up with the uh, EC, uh, which is simply a dumb box, to move those switches and platform doors, it becomes much more easier for interoperability. And this architecture, it, it can allow operators to select multiple suppliers uh, for, their, uh, for their system. Um, some of these standards organizations like IEEE and Senelac um, they should explore this architecture from an interoperability perspective um, and IRC as well uh, to, to look at this architecture for interoperability within the CBTC because currently uh, with CBTC interoperability is a major major item for many operators once you have a supplier on your site that signaled that line that's the only supplier they can live with because you cannot bring another supplier to to, to replace such, for example, the vehicle controller or the wayside. It has to be from that same supplier. The only exception is, is New York City Transit, where they have actually defined an interoperability spec I squared S, and they are able to have um, a vehicle controller from Siemens communicating with the wayside of Talus, um, and they've done that. But it's a very unique, it's a very New York specific spec. They are trying to bring it into the into industry for whatever reason, it hasn't uh, really gained traction yet. Um, but personally, in the future, in my opinion, I believe interoperability is possible with a, a train-centric or vehicle-centric type of architecture. It becomes easier for suppliers to, to, uh, to create uh, an interface that can be compatible with each other. And it's something that some of these standard organizations, IEEE, ARIMA, Senelac, uh, IRSC, uh, should look at and investigate uh, to see where that goes. So those are your architectures. Um, you have the uh, CBI.